Uh, my name is Glenn Howard. I'm president of the Jamestown Foundation here in Washington, D.C. We're delighted that you're here today, able to join us for this wonderful discussion that we're having. Uh, the title of the conference today is Russia in the Middle East. Uh, we have, at the Jamestown Foundation, we have been uh, undergoing a project on Russia and the Middle East for the past year, uh, organizing a series of workshops and papers uh, that have been coordinated and organized by Dr. Stephen Blank and Ted Karasik, uh, who have also helped us put together this conference today. As many of you know, Syria is at the center of Russia policy in the Middle East as Moscow uses its relationship with Iran to back the Assad regime and piece Syria back together again after a series of victories on the battlefield as the U.S. regroups and assesses its strategy. In the past year, we have seen tremendous tension from every angle building around Syria, ranging from the destruction of ISIS in eastern Syria to tensions between the U.S. and Turkey over U.S. military support for the Kurdish forces in Syria, and ranging on to the Golan Heights and the deepening tension between the Syrian government and Israel as Syrian uh, military forces have retaken territory in the south. How Russia balances these developments while backing the Assad regime is going to test the limits of Putin's balancing act and strategy. Today, you're going to hear a variety of perspectives about Russian policy in the Middle East as we move for our first panel, which will discuss the Israel-Iran-Syria triangle and how Russia balances the relationship with the U.S. increasingly removes itself from the scene, eager to avoid becoming bogged down in the conflict there. This will involve our morning discussion, and then later on, we'll move to several different panels. But at noon, we have the great honor of having U.S. Air Force retired General Frank Gorinch, who will be sharing his thoughts and assessments about the Russian air challenge in Syria and U.S. efforts to deconflict and avoid a confrontation over Syrian airspace. Uh, this will be a very, I think, a very interesting and enlightening uh, presentation as a General Gorinch is retired four-star general, a former commander of U.S. Air Forces in uh, Europe. Uh, and it has a very interesting perspective on the region. So we're going to get started today, but also if those joining the Twitter conversation, you can tweet us at Jamestown Tweets, uh, Russia, Middle East. If you have any tweets, be sure to follow that. And we're also being broadcast live on uh, the website of uh, C-SPAN, so we welcome all the C-SPAN followers out there today. Uh, I'll turn the floor over to, to Michael Ryan, who is chairing and moderating this, uh, the first panel this morning. Uh, Michael Ryan is a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation. Michael? Thank you, Glenn. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I understand my role as moderator is to direct questions and to break up fights, so I, I will do that with, with vigor. Um, uh, the other part, the commentator, I think you want to listen to our illustrious panel members, and so I will limit my comments, uh, except for a, an initial uh, comment with, with three takeaways. Uh, my background is in the Middle East. That's what I study. And so I wanted to say something about the Levant, known in Arabic as Asham, and it's a, and the substrate of the conversation, that, that part of the conversation that we'll have in this panel. Uh, the first is Syria, uh, Asham, uh, was uh, responsible for some of the origins of jihadi Salafism, the, the ideology of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and every other jihadist uh, pretty much in the Middle East. Um, uh, they, they, were, they were part of the, the religious uh, aspect of that. They also provided an, a, an insurrection under the Muslim Brotherhood that served as a teaching point for original Al-Qaeda about how not to uh, do an insurrection. Uh, they were handily defeated you know, in, in, in Syria uh, by 1982. Uh, the second thing is that I think there's a, a somewhat of a consensus that Al-Qaeda or ISIS, no matter what they're called, whatever names they take, are going to be around for yet a while, you know, maybe as long as another generation. And the third, I'll just go out with a, with a, a point that, that uh, I can't substantiate, but I believe, is that we will have another insurrection in Asham uh, because there's a lot of bitterness uh, and you have both the ideology and the men under arms uh, to, to do it again. Uh, so having said that, um, I would direct you to uh, your materials to read the, the long and rather illustrious uh, background of our panel members. But we're going to start off with, with Stephen Blank, who's a senior fellow at the American Foreign Policy Council and many other things, um, uh, to talk about Russia's intersection with this issue. Uh, uh, Michael Eisenstadt, of course, who's a Con Fellow and Director of Military Security Studies Program at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and I must say many other things which you'll find in the biography. And, uh, and, and Nader uh, Uskowi, uh, who uh, is a non-resident senior fellow 
the Scowcross Center for Strategy and Security at, uh, uh, in the Atlantic Council, and many other issues as well. So if we can start with, with uh, uh, Dr. Blank. That one? Yeah, OK. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here and talk to you about how Russia sees this triangle, Iran, Israel, Syria. I would argue that Russia sees itself as being in a fortunate strategic position, but tactically rather delicate position, that it has to maneuver among these three points of the triangle, if you like. But it also is strategically fortunate in that it alone is able to talk to everyone in this uh, configuration in a frank and direct manner without rupturing ties irrevocably. And that's a tribute to Russian diplomacy and strategy in the Middle East, which has been to establish durable contacts and partnerships, working partnerships, if you like, with everybody without getting bogged down in supporting one side or another in their internecine conflicts. Because the United States can't, doesn't talk to Assad, it certainly doesn't talk to Iran. Uh, Russia can talk to Israel as well as it talks to Assad and to the government in Tehran. And again, that signifies a major Russian victory. And it's something we have to keep in mind because Syria is not the only place in the Middle East. Moscow is increasingly active across the Middle East. And what it does in Syria, and the people in Moscow know this, is going to have reverberations across the entire region, maybe even beyond the Middle East. Today, Moscow holds the balance between Iran and Israel. It is endeavoring tactically to wind up the war, finish the military victory, which it is, is almost complete, and create the basis for a durable political order in Syria, whereby Assad will rule the country, perhaps with a modified constitution, but with substantial Russian presence and Iranian presence in Syria, but not a presence that antagonizes Israel to the point where Israel feels it has to go to war or undertake military strikes against Iran. Because Russia does not want to see another Israeli-Arab war or an Israel-Iran war for many reasons. First of all, I think they believe that Iran would lose if it's in Syria. Secondly, they're afraid that any kind of war involving Israel will bring back the United States and the US military to the area and undo everything they have carefully built up in the last five to seven years. Third, it puts the future of Assad's government at great risk. And fourth, Moscow does not have the means to sustain a long-term operation against Israel and the United States in the Middle East and doesn't want to do so. It would much rather be exploiting conflicts rather than having to stand on the sidelines or be dragged into somebody else's conflict. And the exploitation of conflicts or of fissures and of regional cleavages is the essence of Russian foreign policy in many regions of the world and is part of a deliberate strategy uh, which is essentially to exploit those cleavages wherever they are, to create regional bipolarity, forcing the United States to treat Moscow as an equal in order then to create global multipolarity where Russia is an equal to the United States. And we have to understand that Russia is not playing a strictly regional game. It is playing a global game. It sees itself as a global superpower. It is not only active in the Middle East, but elsewhere too, but is using the Middle East, as I will show, in order to leverage other kinds of presence and force the West, not just the United States, to accept it on its own terms. So with regard to Iran and Israel, Moscow fully understands that Israel Will not, will not try to undermine Assad, that Israel is not anti-Russian as far as Middle East interests go, but it is determined not to have Iran threaten its vital interests. The problem is that for Iran, Assad ruling over all of Syria and establishing or permitting massive Iranian presence and a landline from Iran all the way to the Mediterranean through Lebanon to support Hezbollah and other terrorists is a vital interest for the government in Tehran as well. And therefore, Moscow is trying to forge an equilibrium between Iran and Israel so that Iran can get much of what it wants, namely Assad will rule Syria. Israel has signed off on this. 
they think the United States has, or at least did before Helsinki, and at the same time that Iran will allow itself to be, quote, evicted, if you want to use that term, from the area around Israel. So 10 days ago, Moscow, or a week ago, Moscow proposed in Jerusalem that Iranian forces be kept out of a district which is 100 kilometers from the 62 miles from the Golan Heights, that Israel and Syria abide by the 1974 agreement on the Golan, and that they would guarantee it. The Israelis turned them down flat to some consternation or surprise in Moscow because Israel's policy is that the Iranian military presence in, Iraq, in Syria has to be completely withdrawn. The problem from Moscow's point of view is that while they understand Israel's security interest, taking the Iranians out of Syria means that Assad's government is not secure at any point in time or anywhere really in Syria. And Moscow is not about to commit ground forces to Syria in order to sustain Assad against his people. The ideal outcome for Russia would be a solution that holds the balance between Israel and Iran, gets the United States out of Syria in return for other concessions, perhaps recognition of Russian equities in Europe, about which we can talk, the creation of some sort of notional anti-terrorist coalition with Moscow and Washington in the lead that allows Moscow to do what it wants, but that Assad rules over Syria, possibly in a modified way, but without any challenges, and that the Iranian presence in the rest of the country is there because in any case, Moscow cannot eject Iran from all of Syria, and it would be counterproductive for it to try. Now, underlying that kind of thinking is the fact that Iran has long been seen in Moscow in the following way. One, it is a state with which we must have an enduring relationship despite all the difficulties that exist in Iran or Russian relations, and the fact that, let's be honest, Tehran does not like Moscow and probably Moscow doesn't like Tehran very much either. Nonetheless, Iran is a major player in the Middle East, and its equities must be respected, and it, Moscow must find a way to work with it. As a matter of fact, a decade ago, Lavrov said that if we are to have a peace conference in the Black Sea region, Iran must be invited, which is recognizing Iran's interests in that part of the world. They see Iran also as a potential market for Russian energy deals and major arms sales, the Iranians claim they just signed a $50 billion deal with Moscow. Moscow denied it, but there are other major deals already in progress or on the table. And third, Moscow has always tried to create a block in the Middle East of states that support it against the United States' efforts to be the unilateral security manager in the Middle East. Now that we apparently are foregoing that quest, the creation of this block becomes all the more attractive and vital for Russia. Now, it so happens that they created this block in 1978-79. I might be the only person in the room who remembers that. It was called the Rejectionist Front. It was I Iran, Iraq, and Syria against Camp David. Oddly enough, those are the same three states that they want to create a block with now. Or not, if not necessarily a block, but a working partnership. And interestingly enough, they're all Shiites. I would suspect that the idea behind this originated with Yevgeny Primakov, whose ideas still resonate in the Kremlin, even though he passed away three years ago. So Iran is important from that point of view. But at the same time, the Russians know that what is most important to them is a working co partnership, as they understand the term, with the United States, where the U.S. and the West recognize their greater global status pretensions, including Europe, and they are prepared and always have been to sacrifice their relationship with Iran to that imperative in the quest for, and the key word here is durable, a durable U.S. working, rela working relationship with the United States. They can do that now because of the fact that once the United States walked out of the JCPOA, the Russian government became the only refuge for Iran. Europe will do nothing for Iran. That's pretty clear. Certainly the United States won't, even though Trump now says he will negotiate with anybody in Iran. They certainly do not believe him. That leaves Russia. So Iran does not have anywhere to turn except Russia and possibly China. And while China may give it money, it can't give it the political and military support that it needs against the West. Therefore, Russia's in a position, or so it believes, to 
deliver, if I may use that term, Iran in some sense. But it is not strong enough or willing to enforce a situation where Iran is kicked out of Syria altogether. Because it can't do that, and it knows that this would just simply further destabilize Syria and undermine everything Moscow has accomplished. So it is in a strategically fortunate position. It is now the primary interlocutor between Israel and Iran, and the United States has been forced to accept Russia on its terms, which is the way the Russians saw the Helsinki t summit. It is also the primary interlocutor between Syria and Jordan, as the recent agreement shows. And also it is, as we'll discuss later today, fully active in North Africa and the Gulf, and even using that springboard to go into sub-Saharan Africa. However, tactically, it is now in a delicate position because as the war winds down, it has to change gears from being primarily a military actor to an actor who now builds a durable and legitimate status quo. And the jury is still out as to whether or not that can happen. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Mr. Eisner? Good morning, and I uh, just want to thank the Jamestown Foundation for holding this event and for the invitation. Um, I'll start up front with uh, my bottom lines, which is kind of a, a general assessment, and then I'll segue to my kind of um, uh, perception of how the Israelis view the evolving conflict with Iran in Syria. Um, if you want to know what a, an Israel-Iran war looks like, you've seen it um, already um, in the, in the uh, series of uh, limited uh, engagements that both have uh, already had in Syria. Both sides want to avoid a general war um, for reasons of geography. It's um, very difficult because they don't share borders uh, for such a war to occur, occur. But the fact that the last four Arab-Israeli wars, the three in Gaza and the one in Lebanon in 2006, occurred as a result of an unintended escalatory process gives reason for concern that that escalation could occur and something much broader could occur. And I would argue that if Hezbollah were to get involved um, in a fight between Israel and Iran, that would be the factor which would cause a broadening and, and an escalation of the conflict, perhaps to a regional war. But I'll discuss that a little bit in a moment. But going, getting back to Israel um, and how it looks at uh, developments in recent years. First, it's important to note that the, the Golan Front with Israel has, since 1974 and the disengagement agreement, probably been, um, except for you know, for, 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 a, for a, uh, a border with a country that's still at war with Israel, it's been very quiet. Um, and it's been just about as quiet as Israel's borders with the countries that it is at peace with, you know, the Jordanian and the Egyptian border. Um, when the Syrian civil war kicked off, Israel was faced with a situation that, um, from their point of view, there was no good outcome. Assad was not so great, although he was a devil they knew, and as I said before, he was able to keep the border quiet, although his support for Hezbollah in the past was the main way in which he engaged in proxy warfare against Israel. Um, on the other hand, the opposition forces uh, contained in their ranks um, jihadist groups um, who probably had, um, from an Israeli point of view, the intention of once getting rid of Assad, turning their guns on Israel. So from their point of view, there was, there was no good outcome. So Israel basically sufficed itself with defining and defending four red lines, which was um, the violation of the Golan ceasefire, transfer of chemical weapons to terrorists, transfer of game-changing weapons to Hezbollah, and the deployment of advanced SAMs that would limit Israel's aerial freedom of action over Syria. Um, and Israel has acted uh, to enforce these four red lines. But we've seen in the, in, since 2015 or so, the dramatic geopolitical transformations in Iran's role in the region from a strategically lonely power to the leader of the region's most cohesive bloc um, at the head of, um, uh, of its own Shiite foreign legion, which is now operating in Syria in which um, Hassan Nasrallah has announced would partake in any future war with Israel. Iran has been transformed from a country fearing encirclement by the US to a country practicing encirclement of, his, of America's regional allies. Saudi Arabia via Yemen, and Israel via Lebanon, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza, and now they're trying to establish a base of operation um, in the Golan uh, against um, Israel. And also, if you take uh, Ayatollah Khamenei's word, um, 
that after the 2014 Gaza war, where he urged the international community to arm the Palestinians in the West Bank as well, that I would hold out as a aspirational Iranian goal to kind of uh, create a situation where they can arm the Palestinians in the West Bank. But that's not going to happen anytime soon, as long as Israel and Jordan uh, remain uh, able to secure the border there. Um, with the Syrian civil war winding down, um, Iran increasingly invested resources um, and its attention in creating an infrastructure in Syria that could use as a platform project for, for projecting power in the Levant and against Israel. And there are several components of this buildup in Syria that we've been seeing in the last few years. First of all, their efforts to establish factories for the production of highly accurate guided missiles in Syria and Lebanon for use presumably in Lebanon by Hezbollah and in Syria by its, uh, the Syrian government and, and various Iranian proxies there. Um, and, and keep in mind, the idea of this is that in the past, Israel has been able and the United States have been able to interdict Iranian armed shipments uh, to Hezbollah and, and some of its other uh, proxies. Um, and Israel has conducted over 130 strikes against arms shipments in Syria destined for Hezbollah. So by creating factories in Lebanon and Syria, it makes it easier um, for I Iran or for Iran's proxies to arm themselves, and it makes it harder for Israel and the United States to interdict these shipments because they're being, the, the weapons are being developed locally. We've also seen um, Iran creating Syrian and Iraqi militias to serve as proxies against Israel. Now, of course, a lot of these militias were primarily created to fight and prosecute the war against the regime in Syria, uh, excuse me, against the opposition in Syria. Um, in Iraq, they were created to fight ISIS. But of course, you know, they can be easily repurposed. And we've seen um, in the, uh, the, the group, the Iraqi group, uh, Harakat Hezbollah uh, Nujaba, they announced the creation of a Golan Liberation Brigade. I don't know if it really exists in fact, but they announced it and with the idea that um, they would have elements that would fight in any future war against Israel. And we've seen tour, tours of the Lebanese-Israel border by some of these Iraqi groups, presumably um, a kind of a area familiarization kind of visit um, to prepare them, presumably um, beyond the propaganda purposes of these visits, to prepare them uh, for the possibility of participating in future wars. Iran also built intelligence collection sites um, in Syria uh, that were directed against Israel. Part of this is for early warning, but part of it is probably to, again, to build up uh, their knowledge of the Israeli enemy um, in order to facilitate future operations. And then logistical facilities in Syria um, in order to support their militias there. Again, it's to support them in the civil war and their operations um, against the uh, anti-regime forces there, but also perhaps to garrison them um, and, and to use them as a, a staging area for our operations in the future against Israel. And as I mentioned, this is part of kind of a larger project of creating a network of proxies all around Israel and in, in other theory, theaters against Saudi Arabia to, make, to enable Iran to threaten um, America's foremost uh, regional allies uh, from multiple directions. Now, Israel has been motivated by its concerns of uh, avoiding a repetition of, this, of the uh, scenario that uh, evolved in the last 30 years with regard to Hezbollah, where Hezbollah in the 80s was a small, ragged guerrilla group and now has eventually emerged as a world-class hybrid military organization. Um, Israel sees the initial um, first steps of such a process occurring in Syria with the creation of kind of Hezbollah-like organizations in Syria. Again, the main purpose ha which, uh, of which has been to fight the opposition in Syria. But again, once that war winds down, if it ends, um, they could be repurposed and eventually built up to serve uh, Iran's purposes in the context of a, of a fight against Israel. So Israel has, uh, watching, watching these things happen, as I mentioned before, Israel since 2013 has been uh, in, in engaged in what they call a campaign between the wars against Hezbollah, more than 130 strikes against Hezbollah-related targets in Syria, uh, arms convoys and arms depots. Um, and they've now broadened that um, campaign to encompass Iranian targets. Okay. Now, on the one hand, the fact that Israel has been able to conduct over 130 strikes against Hezbollah-related related targets in Syria since 2013, without that leading to a war, perhaps give, re, gives reason to hope that 
the emerging Israel-Iran conflict in Syria can be successfully managed or contained. Okay, so I think that needs to be said from the outset. As I mentioned also before, neither Iran nor Israel want a major conventional war. Their preferred mode of um, operation in both cases is to operate below the threshold of general conflict. Okay, so that's a factor which I think militates towards the continued management of this conflict. Okay, on the other hand, as I mentioned before, the last four Arab-Israeli wars have all kind of started that way and escalated to something uh, much larger. So that's a countervailing factor. And there's several other countervailing factors here that we, I think have to be considered. Um, I mentioned before the thing that can really change this is that if Hezbollah gets dragged into the conflict with Israel, Hezbollah, Iran has a limited military infrastructure in Syria right now. The estimates are they probably don't have more than 2,000 Quds Force advisors and fighters um, in Syria. Um, they haven't built up a, a missile array or a, a ground forces there um, like you have, in, like you have in, in Lebanon. And if Hezbollah were to be dragged into a conflict, Again, you have the 100,000 rockets um, that Hezbollah has, including rockets that could range throughout, of Israel, throughout Israel. And if Israel would want to stop the launch of rockets, they'd have to go in on the ground. So, but the fact is right now, Hezbollah has become too important for Iran to risk in such a war. Um, and as a result, they've created these proxies for its proxy. I mentioned before some of these Iraqi and Syrian groups that are being created to engage Israel from the Golan so that Hezbollah does not get dragged into such a war. And I don't want to go too much into this because I know, I think Nasser is probably going to be talking about this. Um, Israel has also been concerned that um, Iran and Hezbollah may have been emboldened by their successes in Syria in recent years and might reinforce their propensity for, to overreach. And we saw it back in February, two incidents, one involving the Syrians in eastern Syria, um, the, the, uh, the Syrians working with the uh, Russian um, uh, mercenaries to attack uh, Syrian Democratic Force units where there were embedded U.S. advisors that resulted in American uh, airstrikes and the killing of at least 200, perhaps, um, of, of these uh, r r Russians and, and, and uh, pro-regime forces. And then we saw the Iranian overflight of Israel uh, by the UAV in February, a, a, a supposedly an armed UAV. Um, so the Israeli and the American response, I think, has put both Iran and Syria on their heels and caused them to act with greater caution as a result. But I think if you look at the strategic profile of both actors, when, they, when they've decided on a strategic direction, they will sometimes back off, but then they will try to find other ways to achieve their goals and to reattack by other means, so to speak. Now, the tensions in Gaza, I think that's a factor that maybe is a constraining factor in some ways because Israel you know, having, having to deal with the tensions on the border and, and, and the violence on the border in recent months doesn't want a two-front war if they could avoid it. And that might kind of militate towards caution. But to the degree that Israel sees, to some extent, Iran trying to egg Hamas on um, in, in Gaza might actually, you know, kind of militate in the other direction. So it's not clear to me exactly how Gaza plays out in Israeli calculations. But by and large, in the past, Israel has tried to avoid two front wars. Russia is also a complicating factor right now. Russia um, has played a role in, in that they have not, um, they've apparently, I don't know if they've given a green light or a yellow light, how you would characterize it, but has not done anything to interfere with Israeli operations in Syria against Hezbollah or against Iranian forces there. And as long as that remains the case, um, I think I Israel will be able to um, conduct air operations against um, Iran's emerging infrastructure there. And the question is whether Iran is able to continue, is able to build infrastructure faster than Israel can destroy it. I think the verdict is out on that, but if, if Russian policy were to change, that could have a major factor um, on Israel's uh, freedom of action. Um, and it's not clear whether it'll constrain it or actually cause Israel to double down to try to reassert its freedom of action to prevent Iran from um, using a change in Russian policy to further um, create its, to build up its infrastructure there. There's also a, another factor at, uh, at work here. Um, the, 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 the Israelis recently hit a pro-regime um, Iraqi militia in eastern Syria and Deir Ezzor, um, killing uh, up to 50 people, including 20 members of Qatar Hezbollah, which is this Iraqi militia. 
Um, at first, I think there were concerns that this could lead to perhaps the targeting of American troops in the region, but Qatab Hezbollah recently came out with a statement saying that um, if Israel hits them in Iraq, Americans will be at, at jeopardy. Well, the thing is, the Israelis were not hitting them in Iraq. The Israelis hit them in Syria, and I don't think the Israelis have any intention in hit, hitting them in Iraq. So I think this is one factor that, as long as this remains the red line for groups like Qatar, Hezbollah, that will be another factor militating against escalation. And then finally, the U.S. escalation, uh, the U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA adds another layer of complexity, and there's always the possibility that these two parallel kind of um, lines, the Israeli operations against Iran and Syria, and, like, and vice versa, and perhaps emerging tensions between the United States and Iran as a result of the JCPOA could eventually kind of merge and have a reinforcing effect. So anyhow, let me conclude by saying, um, as I said before, the fact that Israel has conducted so many strikes against Hezbollah in the last five years raises, you know, perhaps, perhaps could provide a reason for, I don't wanna use the term optimism, but hope that Israel and Iran could manage their conflict in Syria. Um, but I think there are a number of factors that could lead to escalation. First, um, if Israel proves unable to limit the growth of Iran's military infrastructure there over time, it'll, it'll probably it'll, um, incentivize them to intensify their operations there. Um, and Iran might seek to respond by um, escalating further against Israel as a result either from Syria or elsewhere in the world. Or if Iran thwarted in Syria, feels a need to be able to strike back at Israel, they might decide to act against Israel outside of Syria, perhaps by conducting terrorist attacks elsewhere in the world, and that could cause Israel to respond elsewhere. And then finally, the last point I'm going to make is that, as I mentioned before, if Hezbollah gets into the fray, all bets are off. Because as I said before, if Hezbollah is involved, that means it's quite likely they'll use um, their inventory of, of rockets against critical infrastructure in Israel, and Israel will want to hit back uh, critical infrastructure, not just in Lebanon, but perhaps in, in Iran. Uh, and I'll just note that Iran's oil industry is located in the southwest part of the country, which is the part of Iran that's closest to Israel. Um, and, if, is, and, and this might be at a time when um, the United States is trying to put maximum pressure, economic pressure on Iran, this might be a tempting target. And if Israel, in such a situation, hits Iran's oil industry, Iran might respond by hitting uh, oil industry across uh, the Gulf in the Arab states, especially if they are cheering Israel on. I think this is a you know, kind of low likelihood, high impact event. I don't saying this is something that's likely, but this is, I'm just trying to show a path how a local conflict could eventually become a regional conflict um, you know, despite the desire of all the parties to keep it limited. And that concludes my comments, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Am I on now? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, uh, uh, would you like to uh, to start? Mr. Uh, let me thank uh, James Jamestown uh, Foundation for organizing such a, a timely uh, conference. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this panel. Uh, Iran's uh, uh, strategy in Syria has actually changed. Uh, Iran began uh, uh, in uh, inter interference in uh, uh, Syrian civil war, military intervention in Syrian civil war at the outset in 2011 with the specific objective of defeating the Sunni opposition and keeping Assad in power. Um, late 2016, early 2017, uh, those objectives were virtually achieved. Uh, the uh, Iran-led uh, forces uh, victory over the opposition in Aleppo uh, in December 2016 uh, was the beginning of an end of the opposition movement the way we knew it in Syria. Uh, so. Uh, uh, logically, Iran should have evacuated its forces and forces under its command, including the Shia militias, out of, out of Syria. It, they, they did not. That's when the strategy changed. Uh, the new strategy in, uh, in Syria for Iran is basically uh, has two main goals. One is a projection of power, especially uh, in regards to the Shia community 
in the region, showing Iran is still involved as a major power in, in Syria, even in post-conflict Syria. And the second and probably more important one for Iran is to be uh, to have its forces deployed uh, close to the Israeli front positions. Uh, it's been something they've been talking about since the first days of the revolution. As a matter of fact, the uh, IRGC Quds Force, the agency, Iranian agency that is in charge of the Iranian policy in Syria, is was named Quds, means Jerusalem Force. Uh, to eventually one day liberate uh, Jerusalem. And that was, that was the stated goal of the, uh, of the Islamic Republic. Uh, so they chose this opportunity to be in Syria, to be as close to Israelis as they had ed ever uh, dreamed of, uh, in order to counterbalance Israel's power, to counterbalance Israel's influence in that area. Uh, to do those two, uh, those two new objectives, new strategy, uh, Iran needed to have, a, for the Quds Force and for the uh, forces under its command, which included, uh, at least in Aleppo, up to 80,000 Shia militia uh, 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 acting as the ground force, as the land force uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the Quds Force uh, operations. Uh, uh, they, they needed a full freedom of movement uh, in the country, uh, and also, uh, they needed to have a direct supply line uh, from Iran to, the, uh, to Syria if they wanted to stay there permanently or more permanently than they had, uh, they had intended before. Um, yes, they did have air bridge uh, between Iranian airports and Damascus airport, but during uh, times of conflict, uh, uh, airfields can be taken out uh, fairly quickly. Uh, and a land bridge not only gave them projection of power, uh, but also they could move heavy equipment and uh, larger formations uh, of personnel uh, easier on, on, the, on the land force. So they had, they had, to, they had to create a, uh, the so-called land bridge, uh, connecting uh, uh, Iran uh, through Iraq to Syria, Lebanon, and the Israeli uh, front position. Uh, on a tactical level, Iran also wanted to stay in Syria because they thought the U.S. Uh, under uh, both administration, they thought the U.S. would be would be leaving Syria soon, and they would follow U.S. to fill in the uh, vacuum that is left by the U.S. Uh, uh, they're going to uh, move into the territory that is going to be left by uh, by U.S. and its allies in Syria. Uh, so to do all of those all of those new objectives. Iran needed to permanently base its forces uh, in, uh, in Syria. Uh, so they started leasing parts of dozens of Syrian uh, military bases across Syria, especially in the south. Uh, um, people have counted up to probably 40 different bases, that, uh, uh, military bases that uh, Iran has, uh, has installations in those. Uh, now, uh, why they need all those bases? Of course, they need to house their command and control center. They need to house their intelligence uh, uh, cells. Um, uh, they need to have their UV, uh, UAV uh, uh, command and control and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, runways. And, uh, and they need m more than anything else uh, to base uh, tens of thousands of uh, Shia militias under their command uh, in those in those bases, uh, so that's where uh, that's where the uh, the, uh, the uh, how they're going about uh, to stay in, in Syria on a permanent basis. Uh, of course, this is not happening in vacuum. Uh, the uh, uh, while they were successful in Syria in Aleppo, uh, ironically, soon after that, Iran itself. Inside Iran, uh, they started uh, uh, facing serious problems, economic problems, uh, inside Iran. Uh, uh, we, uh, you have been following uh, the uh, meltdown, economic meltdown in the country, collapse of the, uh, of the, of the national currency, and, and the result of that has been discontent among the population, and we have seen it in a wave of different demonstrations and protests throughout. 
this is um, this is happening within that context. On the near abroad for Iran, aside from Syria, there is also uh, 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 things happening that is affecting Iran's strategy in Syria directly. Uh, the latest um, pronouncement by uh, Quds Force Commander General Soleimani is just one example of that. That he said that if if the oil uh, uh, Iranian oil is not going to be exported uh, uh, from the uh, from the Persian Gulf. No oil will be exported from, Ter uh, from the Persian Gulf. Uh, uh, to the uh, the logical extent of that is that Iran is getting ready for uh, uh, um, for some kind of a kinetic uh, operations within in in the region if the times comes that they that they uh, they uh, they follow the threats that they have made in the in the past few weeks. So you have. On one hand, you have the economic problems and uh, uh, unrest within Iran, and then you have another uh, front in the Persian Gulf that, uh, and the Bab al-Mandab in, in, uh, in, in Yemen that might open up. So those two uh, could very well limit Iran's desire to stay in Syria permanently, and as a matter of fact, could be the factors that, uh, that can push Iran to come to some kind of a compromise in Syria. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, on the uh, uh, staying, staying uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Syria permanently runs actually counter to uh, what uh, um, uh, uh, Mike explained to all Israelis' intentions. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it is, it is uh, very uh, clear that Israel does not want to have any Iranian military uh, formations permanently stationed in Syria. Uh, uh, they have said so publicly. As a matter of fact, they, uh, uh, what uh, um, Steve uh, mentioned, they rejected uh, Russian's uh, offer of uh, a 100 kilometer, 62 miles buffer zone between Iranian forces and the, uh, uh, and the forces under the command of the Iran, including Hezbollah, and the uh, 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 borders of Israel. Uh, because uh, not that they don't want to have that, but from the Israeli point of view, that's not enough for them. And, and all of, because Iran can still have its uh, Shia militias stationed outside the buffer zone, the Iran's can still have long, longer range rockets and missiles uh, deployed outside the buffer zone. Iran can still have the uh, land bridge outside the buffer zone to supply its forces from Iran. And all of those things would be unacceptable to Israel. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, so this, the, uh, from the Israeli point of view, the solution would be uh, that Iran has to leave uh, uh, Syria altogether. So you, now you can see uh, the looming uh, major conflict between Iran and Israel brewing. On one side, Iran wants to stay there permanently. On the other side, Israel wants Iran to leave Syria now. Uh, that's the essence of the looming conflict that is that is brewing in the in that part of the um, uh, the world. Uh, now, and Israelis have put, by the way, their money where their mouth is. Uh, uh, whenever they have, they find uh, uh, occasions, they have hit Iranian uh, forces directly. Uh, uh, the uh, May 10 uh, incident uh, that is that Israeli forces uh, hit back at Iranian uh, forces in a, after, after, they had, after they had sent some rockets into the uh, uh, Israeli occupied Golan. Uh, 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 um, after they have that, that they, they Israelis hit back in massive, disproportional, and coordinated air and missile attack on almost all of Iranian installations within Syria. Uh, uh, the first major uh, uh, um, action by the Israeli uh, military against Iranian, directly against Iranian forces. Uh, and these are some of those bases that I was talking about that Iran is using in, in, in Syria. And that day, Israel hit dozens of those installations within those bases. Um, um, so the, uh, the message from, 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 uh, from Israel uh, was very clear that Iran cannot stay. Now, how can we compromise, come with a compromise between these two, uh, uh, these two, uh, 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 extreme uh, uh, um, uh, objectives. 
uh, I agree, Russians tried, tried, uh, are trying their, uh, their best to do so. Uh, they're trying to have Iran to pull back 100 kilometers from the border. Um, but that might not be enough for Israel, and it's not enough for Israel, and they have said so. So it has to be more than that. Uh, probably a solution like Iran keeping some advisors uh, uh, embedded within, within the uh, Syrian military, uh, and then uh, 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 having Hezbollah to have a presence uh, and operate out of areas adjacent to the Lebanese-Syrian uh, border, uh, 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 above and beyond uh, pulling back 100 kilometers from the border. A uh, combination of all of those uh, could, uh, uh, could give Israel uh, a reason to probably to uh, compromise on the, on, uh, on, the situ uh, on, on the subject. And that's what the Russians are, are really pushing hard these days. Um, and uh, from Iranian point of view, it uh, probably if this was happening two years ago, it would not have been acceptable. But things are not happening in vacuum and situation in Iran uh, and the situation in Babul Mandab and the situation in Persian Gulf uh, Strait of Hormuz is very serious and could push them into such a compromise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before opening the, uh, the, the floor to questions, I'd like to, to ask um, a question of, of, of each of our panelists, uh, starting uh, with, with Stephen. Um, I have heard in, in meetings in, uh, in government circles that uh, Russia's uh, relationship with the United States involves uh, an analysis of what our threshold is before we react um, with military force or, or significant other kinds of, of actions. Uh, could you tell me what, in, in essence, Russia's um, uh, view of uh, United States red line in, in, the, in the Levant as far as Russia goes in the future? I think that the, I mean, the Russians have never articulated their view of what constitutes an American red line, although I'm sure they've discussed this intensely among themselves. Obviously, any direct attack by Russian forces or people using Russian weapons on American forces or American citizens, let's say, for example, an oil tanker, a commercial uh, vessel, uh, might constitute one of them. Certainly, Russian, and use the word collusion, uh, in an attack on Israel would certainly be a red line. Uh, an incident involving Turkey, which after all is a member of NATO, uh, which would or could precipitate Article 4 or 5 uh, action by NATO, uh, would be equally as bad. Uh, from Russia's point of view. And uh, any Iranian military offensive against the Saudis or perhaps one of the other emirates where the Iranians' fingerprints are all too visible, I think would also probably galvanize American uh, reaction uh, in a forceful way. Uh, the same might be true for Egypt, but I don't think Egypt's in any danger uh, from any of those kinds of things. So... Uh, I think those are red lines. And, uh, you know, Moscow has a very thriving relationship with Israel, apart from all of what we've discussed this morning. Uh, there's a lot of commerce and trade. There are four flights a day going back and forth between uh, Tel Aviv and Moscow. Uh, at one point, they were buying Israeli weapons a decade ago. Uh, so you know, things that were, you know, years ago were unheard of. Uh, I, I don't think they want to jeopardize that. But I do think those are what they understand red lines to be. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Eisenstadt. You, you mentioned already uh, Israel's four, uh, four red lines. Could, could you just repeat them succinctly for the, before we start the questions? Yeah. I, I mean, those are um, those, those red lines were related to the, um, the, the civil war between 2011 and, and present, which were any violations of the Golan ceasefire. So occasionally there have been um, a weapons fire crossing uh, the border, and Israel would usually respond um, firing against the source. Transfer of chemical weapons to terrorists, which um, has not happened. In fact, you know the chemical weapons use has been by the regime. Um, but 
you know, the, the Israelis have not have to act, act on that one because the, the weapons were, were under government control there. Uh, transfer of game-changing weapons to Hezbollah. And again, Israel has acted, as I mentioned, you know, more than 130 times to interdict uh, arms transfers. And then the deployment of advanced SAMs uh, to the Syrian uh, regime that would limit Israel's uh, freedom of action. And as a result of the recent um, conflict with Iran, Israel has also struck at Syrian air defenses that try to prevent them from operating. Now, with regard to the, the current red lines, um, I would just say, I, I, I would agree with Nader, there might be, I would say, an equilibrium that could perhaps be reached. Israel had tolerated Iran's involvement in Syria since 2013 until now without striking, and, and Israel started striking last fall, um, mainly because I think Iran was trying to create an infrastructure that was potentially at least dual use. Um, so they were building uh, rocket, uh, rocket factories, um, and that, I don't think that's a red line for Israel, because these are highly accurate rockets that could hit Israel's um, critical infrastructure. That's a red line that Israel will not tolerate. Um, intelligence gathering facilities, again, these were, I think, all of them, I think, were on the Syrian Golan. So those are directed at Israel, that provides Iran with early warning, and also intelligence that they could use for offensive operations. That's a red line. Um, and logistical infrastructure that could serve the projection of force against Israel in the Golan, I think that's a red line. But Iranian forces operating in Syria to support the regime, I'm not sure that's so problematic. So there is the potential, I think, for an equilibrium or a modus vivendi, but it's, it's at a much lower level at which than, than which Iran had been operating recently. And Israel, as a result of its strikes in, in, in May, they often use the term mowing the, lawn, the, the grass. They've cut the grass down to the roots now. And if um, Iran does not try to rebuild, OK, that's a basis maybe for an equilibrium in the long run, as long as they don't get close to the border and they don't you know, build, try to rebuild the factories and this infrastructure. But as I said before, Iran, once they set a strategic direction, generally is very persistent. And I'm skeptical that they'll accept that, at least at this time, maybe in the future, but not for now. Thank you very much. Um, not a is there a red line that, that Iran has before it would uh, strike against Israeli forces directly? Oh, well, the, the red line is not in Syria. Uh, um, uh, Israel hit Iranian facilities, almost all of Iranian facilities in Syria on May 10, and Iranian did not respond. Uh, not that uh, they, uh, they did not they they wanted those uh, they wanted Israelis to attack them, but they were not prepared. Iran is not prepared to go to a, to uh, a major conflict with it, with the with the, uh, with the major uh, superior military force, uh, military to military conflict on a foreign soil. Iran is not prepared for that. Iran has always uh, preferred to operate in the gray zone. Uh, uh, and uh, and as a matter of fact, some of the some of the uh, uh, operations they did in Syria uh, 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 contradicts that doctrine. Uh, for example, uh, sending rockets into Israeli Israeli uh, Golan uh, uh, is is in, in direct contradiction of the of the gray zone uh, 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 doctrine that Iran was following. But I don't think Iran is ready, was prepared, has the forces uh, to start a major conflict with Israel uh, on the. Uh, 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 Syrian soil, and that's one of the reasons that might be uh, room for some compromise. Uh, the, the big red line with Israel uh, would be if Israel attacks oil facilities in Iran, or Israel attacks uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear facilities in Iran, that would be definitely a red line. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to open it up now. Um, uh, Glenn, we have microphones. Uh, I would like to basically before you uh, ask your question, would you please identify yourself? And if you're willing, tell us what your affiliation is uh, so we, we know the question is coming. So uh, first, first question was up front. Then there's a second question. Mark Katz from George Mason University. Thank you for a very, very interesting presentations. Uh, I have uh, two uh, interrelated questions for Steve in particular. Uh, 
you, you mentioned, Steve, that uh, the Russians advertise themselves as being in the position where they can talk to everyone, you know, Israelis, Iranians, whereas the U.S. can't or won't. Uh, but as we know from previous American experience and Arab-Israeli conflict resolution, just the ability to talk isn't, isn't sufficient, that there has to be a combination of of being able to sort of to offer people things, you know, carrots, you know, and, and sticks, the stick being American uh, support for Israel. Um, does, does Russia have a combination of carrots and sticks that it can use to uh, bring about an Israeli-Iranian uh, conflict resolution? Or is that what it's really interested in? And, and if, if, in other words, are they simply interested in tamping down a conflict? And then my second question then is that, as as part of what we've seen is that the Russians have indicated that no, they they can't and they won't remove the Iranians from Syria. Really, they can't, uh, and for the, all the reasons that you stated. But they've also made clear that they're not going to get in the way of Israeli strikes on Iran. And at what point does that affect the Russian-Iranian relationship? In other words, that, that how, how long can they keep on cooperating? Or uh, if, if, if Russia does respond, how is this going to affect the Russian-Israeli relationship? In other words, it seems that at a certain point that this you know, Russia getting along with both Iran and Israel is going to be challenged if, in fact, there's an Israeli-Iranian um, you know, uh, conflict continues. Thank you. Should I answer that now? Okay. The, the ability, first of all, to talk to everybody and de make deals with everybody, and that gets to the carrots and the sticks, is vital to understanding Russia's policy and its success in the Middle East at large, not just in this particular series of issues. You asked about what kind of carrots and sticks they can offer. Let's go through this. With Israel, they have a, thri a, thri a thriving trade. Israel also understands that American support is, although the Trump administration may be very close to Israel, is in the long run not as strong as it once was, and that Israel has to be able to talk to Moscow as well, precisely because Moscow is now a major player in the Middle East. As far as Iran goes, Russia has lots of carrots arm sales, support with regard to the JCPOA and, and in the United Nations, its ability to talk to the Saudis and modify energy prices is important for Iran. And they've, they've stuck it to Iran because they've worked with the Saudis. The Iranians wanted the energy prices to, uh, to go up, uh, caps put on production, and the Russians and the Saudis said no. And the Iranians had to accept it. The uh, Russian calculation, I think, is that Iran may be a difficult partner, but it's a partner. We are able to support where we can support them, we will. Uh, we help them get membership in this Shanghai Cooperation Organization. They have a th thriving trade. There are energy and arms deals to be made. And we can also act by virtue of our ability to make deals with other players like the Gulf states or Israel. We can restrain them from attacking Iran. Because what Russia is trying to do is not only to prevent Iran from threatening Israel, it's trying to prevent Israel from striking back at Iran as well. It's trying essentially to be the referee in a boxing match. Everybody go to a neutral corner and cool off. Now, w the whole objective is to prevent your second question, what happens if it doesn't, it's to pre prevent that. Because the Russians see their ability to, control and escalate conflicts, and not just in the Middle East, you know, all the ones we know about in the Caucasus and Europe and so on, as being essential to their strategy. What they see from the United States is that the United States does not know how to impose escalation control, that it is fighting inconclusive, prolonged wars with no end in sight, which it cannot bring to a close, and which are wreaking havoc all over the place. Now, we can argue whether or not that's a correct assessment, but that's the way they see things. And they see their strategy as being one that allows them to maintain escalation control. Because once they are able to make a deal with somebody, that side is afraid that if they behave badly, as far as Russia's concerned, or if they get into a conflict with one of Russia's other partners, they will lose that Russian support. So they have a vested interest in cooperation with Russia. And this provides them with, and the Russians with a basis for a long-term partnership. And it enables Russia, 
making them enablers to play a major role throughout the Middle East. So the carrots and sticks are inherent in this ability to make deals and have dialogue with people and say, well, you know, we'll support you up to a point. You have a point. They, and then turn around and say, well, you know, the Iranians are right, but on this issue, you're not. Everybody, have to, you have to keep these issues in balance. They're not trying to bring about a resolution of the Iran-Israel conflict. What they're trying to do is bring about a perpetual timeout. There's a question back here. Uh, Stanley Kober. Um, there's a saying attributed to Leon Trotsky. He never said it, but uh, it's a good saying. You may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. We're talking about this as if everybody is in control. What if nobody is in control? And I'm thinking of one issue in particular that has not come up, Jerusalem. There's a lot of stuff going on in Jerusalem. You know, there was a riot last Friday, I think. What if there is an incident to Jerusalem and the Iranians say, we will be the defenders of Jerusalem? Rally round us and make that the fulcrum of the conflict. Once that match is lit, how big is the conflagration? Are you directing that at a particular member? <laughs> Uh, anyone who wants to, uh, Mr. Eisenstein. Yeah. I, I, I mean, look, I, I think the Iranians, when it comes to, and I'm, I, I'm sorry if I'm uh, no, in, 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 impinging on your turf, but um, the, the Iranians um, are very have a very cold-blooded approach to their interests. Okay, if you look at the 2006 uh, Lebanon war, um, there were protests in Tehran um, in support of Hezbollah during the war. Which and you know, not are you tell me if protests occur without official, um, you know, these kind of protests usually I think have official blessing when they do occur, and people were volunteering to go fight. To my knowledge, and there were actually a number of journalists who uh, covered this at the time. None of them were allowed to go. Okay, so the 2006 war would have been actually. I mean, this was you know kind of tailor made for you know given the regimes ostensible commitments to you know, Lebanese Hezbollah and the downtrodden of the world and fighting Israeli aggression, this would have been natural, let the people go, and they didn't, because they didn't want to get dragged into a war um, and have Iranian civilians or citizens killed, and then you know, they have the domestic pressure put on the regime and the like. So I, I, they don't do anything for anybody if it's not in their interests. And right now, by and large, I think they have been trying to act in a very careful way to shape and alter their reg regional status quo and balance of power without having things spiral out of control. That said, I, I said before, it could spiral out of control, so I don't dismiss it. But by and large, they don't allow um, events to drag them into fights that they don't um, want. Now, that, that doesn't mean that they won't escalate or do things, because every once in a while, Iran does something really kind of loopy. Like I said, the, the UA, the overflight, um, of Israel in February, you got Khobar Towers, you've got um, you know Marine Barracks bombing, you've got the attempted assassination of the Saudi ambassador in Washington. So I don't rule out the possibility that they'll do something that'll lead to miscalculation, but they're doing it because it's in their they they believed it was in their interest to do so, not because they got dragged by Palestinian protesters into a fight with Israel. It's the the last thing I think, the last likely way that miscalculation will occur. Matter. Least likely. Uh, just, uh, I agree with that. All that uh, additional concern I have is uh, the uh, more severe internal situation in Iran gets, economic and political, especially if you're going to have a, a massive uh, demonstrations and uh, movement against the regime. Uh, the more likelihood that Iran would welcome a foreign intervention uh, or foreign conflict to deflect attention from that. Uh, even if it's manufactured. So that's a concern I do have, aside from all the concerns. And then there are other areas, like in Bab al-Mandab or, or uh, the coast uh, of Yemen, um, if, if uh, those missiles that Iranian have given to the Houthis uh, hit a US ship or hit um, um, uh, uh, allied ship in a major damage, uh, you never know what would, what would happen. It could start that, uh, that uh, getting out of a spiral. 
Uh, I would say, Stan, also that, uh, you know, we saw what happened in March when they had the embassy ceremony in Jerusalem. Um, the only people who really reacted were Hamas, and they reacted in a predictably self-defeating manner. Uh, nobody in the Arab world w w took any kind of serious action about this for all the rhetoric. Although there are people now saying that this that the administration's, quote, peace plan, which is probably DOA anyway, uh, will not work unless there's something addressing Jerusalem as the Palestinian capital. Uh, I, I, I don't think that an incident in Jerusalem as such is going to provoke the Iranians to t uh, attack Israel. It might provoke, say, Hamas or the Palestinian Authority. That's a different question. Young man right here. Everybody's a young man to me. Also. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Ben Williams. I uh, intern with Jinsa, and I had a uh, I had a question about Hezbollah, which is Hezbollah is often described as a very much a proxy of Iran, but if say the Iranians were to have to cut off uh, support tomorrow, would Hezbollah be able be able to act independently, and would they um, want or end up moving towards another war with Israel? Uh, that's for anyone. Uh, Hezbollah, de the Hezbollah depends on Iran uh, for many things, including a great portion of their budget, probably 80, 90 percent of their budgets, operating budgets, and they need Iran for arms uh, that, uh, uh, for arming them. And, uh, uh, and besides, Hezbollah uh, it has a very close ideological bond to Iran. As a matter of fact, it was uh, formed by the Iranians a uh, uh, few years after the victory of the revolution in, uh, in Iran uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, after, after the Iranians uh, forced a split into uh, the Fatah, uh, uh, movement, uh, bringing the Shias of the Fatah out, and then, uh, uh, and then within the Amal movement, and also uh, 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 bringing individual, even leftist uh, 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 Lebanese, uh, then uh, Shias, and put them all together and, and, and form that Hezbollah. So uh, if, if Iran uh, stop, uh, uh, stop its uh, support from Hezbollah altogether for any number of reasons, um, then the Hezbollah would not be the Hezbollah we know of, would be a different, uh, would be just a political organization within the Lebanese uh, political system, not the Hezbollah we know. Next question. There seems to be a geographical, you know, sort of bias right here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, my name is Carmelina, and my question can go to anyone on the panel, but given the recent involvement of Iran going closer and closer to the Golan Heights. Um, what are the practical implications of the disagreement agreements, or the dis disengagement agreements, specifically 74, um, in regards to the provisions that provide specific restrictions on Israeli and Syrian forces and the management of airspace? And over time, do we s expect those to slowly start to degrade, or do we expect there to be a, a push on Israel for those to be maintained um, for on both sides? If you'll remember, uh, at the Helsinki summit, two presidents made a specific reference to the fact that they were both concerned about his Israel's security and wanted to ensure that the 74 agreements were kept. Uh, Israeli government has said that it will keep them and that will it will abide by those agreements. Its quarrel is not with Assad. Now, I mean, this is part of the... Uh, public as well as private diplomacy Netanyahu has carried out, uh, and his government has carried out in Moscow and in Jerusalem with Russians, that they are prepared and fully willing to extend by the agreement of 1974, and Assad is too, not that he has much choice in the matter. So if it was left up to Israel and Syria, that agreement would not be disturbed. The only factor that is trying to undermine that agreement is Iran. And uh, I, you know, after what happened to them in May, I'm not, uh, I'm not convinced that they're going to do so in a hurry again. But they are go always going to be trying to find ways to magnify their advantage and push their interests. But they are, as Michael said, they are very 
risk averse when it comes to direct confrontation with a superior military force. So I'm not all that worried that the 74 agreement is in danger from any of the belligerents or from the US and Russia. It is only Iran, and therefore, uh, you know, they, they got taught a pretty good lesson in May. And, and I'll just add that, keep in mind, I think it was in January 2015 when the Israelis, the Israelis struck a uh, convoy uh, killing an Iranian uh, IRGC general and uh, uh, Imad uh, Mughni's son, Jihad, um, who, when they were in, engaged in a kind of a, a battlefield uh, kind of uh, tour. So I, I think any, any Iranians or Shiite militias that try to establish a presence in, in that area are going to be hit. And, and as Steve said, apparently both the United States and Russia have agreed, uh, essentially given, you know, kind of uh, indicated that they would, you know, support tacitly any is Israeli action in that regard. So um, it'll be, I think, a very difficult uh, environment for them to operate in. I, I don't rule out them trying, but uh, It'll, it'll be very difficult. And Israel has, has shown that it has excellent intelligence as well. Um, they, they use the term um, intelligence supremacy um, in Syria, so. Next question. I wonder if, if anybody could talk about uh, Iran and, and Israel's capability in cyber uh, warfare as it pertains to you know, either the U.S. or other actors in the region. Um, because I know that we've discussed some of the, you know, military type of uh, attacks and how risk averse they are, but I think that they have shown some capability to, um, to attack pretty, you know, carefully, and, and, and I think that they have more capability, if you could please address that. Uh, Stephen? Both states have formidable cyber capabilities. Israel, for example, was the uh, co-participant with the U.S. in the Stuxnet uh, incident, or whatever you want to call it, which showed a very high level of proficiency. And of course, Israel is a highly developed uh, cyber state. And they have a lot of capabilities. And everybody knows it. Iran does, too. Uh, if you remember when they, uh, a couple of years ago, they targeted the whole Aramco. Uh, I think they took down Aramco for, for a day or two, which, you know, causes the Saudis immense pain and reverberates through global markets. So the Iranians are quite proficient at cyber warfare as well. But I don't think that that alone is going to uh, bring about uh, the Iran-Israel conflict that people are afraid of. I think it's more likely to be something other than cyber that precipitates that. Nada, you have? Uh, the um, Iranians were not prepared for a Stagnet uh, attack when it happened. And uh, after that, they started having, uh, they uh, really uh, uh, did a lot of investments for uh, first defensive uh, uh, cyber uh, uh, warfare uh, capabilities, and then offensive. And now the IRGC and the Quds Force have their own cyber commands within, within uh, the larger command of the IRGC that uh, are the main actors, Iranian actors involved, involved in preparation for cyber command. And I think Iran is taking it very seriously. And I think it's a, and so is Israel. And is, uh, is an extremely important point to follow. Yes. Next question. Way in the back. Kovalenko, uh, Victor, Ukrainian legal group. I'm sorry, uh, could you speak up a bit? Kovalenko, Viktor, Ukrainian legal group. My question is to Mr. Eisenstein. Uh, you told that uh, Iranians took uh, Aleppo. And as to Russians, uh, the major contribution in the uh, attack on Aleppo was done by them. So could you explain who is who and whom uh, are really re re Russians bombing in uh, Syria? Thank you very much. I'm sorry. C could you... I, I didn't quite understand the, the thrust of the question. If you could just, just re repeat the main th the thrust. Mr. Eisenstadt yes. told that Iranians took Aleppo in 2016. As to Russian uh, government, they made ma major contribution in the attack on Aleppo in, 19, in uh, 2016. So who, which information is true uh, or both true? And second, uh, Russians are bombing somebody in uh, Syria. So whom uh, they are bombing, really? 
uh, ISIS or opposition to uh, Assad or somebody else or everybody? Okay. Um, I, I didn't discuss the, the Aleppo campaign, but I, I'm glad to just state, I mean, look, R Russia was critically important for the, the efforts of the pro-regime forces to defeat the opposition. And, and first, I'll just mention, initially, the um, aerial campaign that the Russia led targeted non-ISIS uh, forces. They targeted uh, the American-supported opposition so that you created this kind of uh, polarization, that, that there was no third way anymore, and that to, to present a dilemma to the rest of the world that either you support the Assad regime or you support groups like ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra and, and kind of uh, jihadists and the like. So that was the initial strategy. Now, of course, now they are, um, you know, going against uh, ISIS too. You know, they captured Palmyra back from ISIS, and although that's still a contested area. So initially, Russia was uh, targeting American-supported uh, rebel groups and rebel groups that were supported by Gulf countries and Turkey, and then they, they, they kind of... Uh, uh, pivoted and, and are, are attacking groups that are, uh, you know, jihadist uh, in, in nature. So I, it, that's my understanding, and I don't, I, I hope that answers the question. Okay. 